Join us as we journey through the Bible in a year with Pastor Chris Dodge of Awake Us Now Ministries. Discover the truths of the Bible and see Jesus from Genesis to Revelation. And now, here's Pastor Dodge with today's message. Uh, let's start out in the book of Ecclesiastes, shall we? And uh, as we do that, just a, a few comments, I believe, that are in order. Uh, one of the, the first questions that arises with this book is, who wrote the thing? The testimony of ancient Jewish rabbis and many of the, the great scholars of Israel, as well as early Christian scholars and Bible students, have held that Solomon was the author. Now, it never clearly says in Ecclesiastes that Solomon was the author, but there is a good deal of circumstantial evidence to suggest that, and we'll see that in just a few moments. I will say this right up front. As I teach Ecclesiastes tonight, I am going to be treating Solomon as the author. And some of that is because of the internal evidence of the book, and some of it is because I deeply believe in the grace of God, and I pray that what we are seeing here in Ecclesiastes is an aged Solomon coming to the realization that everything he devoted his life to was worthless in the end. And while Ecclesiastes has a reputation as being a depressing book, if you look at Ecclesiastes from the vantage point of King Solomon coming back to faith in the living God, it suddenly becomes a very powerful book, and a lot of the depressing things move away to the side. And, and so that's the way we're going to look at it this evening. I want to give you a heads up on that. I freely admit we can't prove Solomon is the author, but we know God is merciful and gracious, and my prayer is that in his last days, Solomon realized the folly of the path he he had pursued in his life and came back to the faith of his youth. That does seem to be the, at the heart of this book, and we'll see that, I think, very clearly as we go through it. Now, what the uh, book of Ecclesiastes does tell us about the author is he is called, sometimes translated, the preacher or the teacher. Uh, the, the Hebrew word is koheleth. It, it is someone who expounds the truths of God. As far as dating the book, I've listed it as uncertain, and that's simply because we know that the individual who wrote this lived in Jerusalem. He ruled in Jerusalem, that he was wiser than anyone else who had ever lived in Jerusalem. It seems to be Solomon, but it could well refer to another uh, descendant of David as a possibility. So it's written somewhere around a thousand years before Christ, but you know has to have been done before the fall of Jerusalem in 586 BC. Characteristics of it, uh, you know, one is obviously it's a very pessimistic book. Uh, it starts out that way. If you listen to the uh, opening words of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 1:1 says, "The words of the teacher Koheleth, son of David, king in Jerusalem." Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. And you read that, and uh, if you're reading it for the first time, you think, what in the world is this all about, and why did I pick this up? Everything is meaningless. But at the heart of that lament, really, is the fact that if you build your life on anything other than the living God, in the end, everything you have done will be meaningless. The bottom line is basically everybody's going to die. It's just that simple. And someday we will all have to face our creator. Now, I should make a qualifying statement there because the scripture makes it very clear. There's one generation that will not see death, and that's the last one. I don't know when that's going to be. We may well be in that last generation. The way the world is going, it's certainly not beyond the realm of the, the very realistically possible. The Bible says that there will be one generation that doesn't die, but everyone else will. And devout followers of the living God throughout the centuries have realized that and recognized that. There's an early Christian author who makes the comment that you will never find pockets in a burial shroud. And the emphasis is you can't take it with you. A couple decades ago, Billy Graham did a, a take on that age-old Christian statement. Uh, he updated it and said, you will never find a hearse pulling a U-Haul. That really is what the author of Ecclesiastes is saying. In the end, we're going to die. It's just that simple. And if our lives have not been built on the living God, we will be sorely disappointed. And there will come a day when you look back and say, wow, did I waste my life? And that's what the author of Ecclesiastes is saying. 
And that's why I pray it is Solomon who wrote this, because he comes to a point where he realizes everything I thought was important really isn't. What we read in Ecclesiastes truly does emphasize that reality and that truth. So on that note, let's dig into the book together, shall we? Let's just begin by taking a look at what the author says here about the meaninglessness of life. He says, uh, chapter 1, verse 3, What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. And then he says in verse 9, What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. It was here already long ago. It was here before our time. And with those notes, the author goes on to discuss what he discovered in his own life. And what he says in chapter 2 is incredibly revealing. And this is why I do pray it is Solomon who's speaking these words. It certainly fits. Chapter 2, beginning at verse 4. This is what we read. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kind of fruit trees in them. This is an individual who has done a great deal of construction. What do we know about King Solomon? He was a builder. Solomon spent seven years building the temple at Jerusalem. And the temple that he built is double the size of the tabernacle in the wilderness. If you compare the book of Exodus with the book of First Kings, you will notice that the dimensions of the tabernacle, the uh, tent of meeting that uh, Moses and the Israelites made while they were wandering in the wilderness, the dimensions of that tabernacle, that tent, are doubled by the temple itself. And the temple covers a footprint that is exactly twice the dimensions of the original tabernacle. What is fascinating, though, and something that just hit me a number of months ago reading it, I had not seen this before. You know, it took seven years to build the temple. It took 14 years to build Solomon's palace. And coincidentally enough, I don't think this is a coincidence, the dimensions given for his palace are the same dimensions as the courtyard of the tabernacle. You know, the tent, the tabernacle itself was a relatively small thing. The courtyard was huge. That's the size that Solomon used for his own house. (laughs) He was a builder and he made this massive thing that took 14 years to construct. If this is Solomon writing, he's saying, you know, I constructed lots of things. And we know that he built uh, chariot uh, fortresses. He built all over Israel. He was a man who did a great deal of construction. He looks back and says, it's all meaningless in the end. And then he goes on to say this. He said, verse 6, I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well the delights of a man's heart. Uh, The word that is translated here, harem, is a a phrase that is only found here in Ecclesiastes. And in fact, it uses a word that is only found here in Ecclesiastes. The footnotes in many of our translations will recognize that the Hebrew is problematic, but it does seem to be referring to the king's harem. And we know that's what Solomon did. He had a huge harem. 700 wives, 300 mistresses or concubines. This is a guy who practiced the very things that the author of Ecclesiastes is saying. And he says, in the end, I had nothing. It was all meaningless. What we know from the scriptures, from the book of 1 Kings and also from Second Chronicles, is that Solomon in his life was led astray by the false religions of his many wives. He ended up sacrificing to pagan gods, uh, gave himself over wholly to false worship. On top of that, this is a man who started out so well with wisdom, and he would have fit in well in 21st century America because he was absolutely obsessed with more stuff and sex. 
And, you know, that was the story of his life. And what the author of Ecclesiastes is saying, I finally came to a point where I realized this is meaningless. He said, you know, I didn't spare myself any pleasure. I did anything my heart wanted. And in the end, I realized it was worthless. Um, how true that is. And in our own culture today, we see many individuals who really devote themselves to personal pleasure, to accumulating things, to having stuff, to enjoying whatever pleasure comes down the road. But there will come a day when all of a sudden you realize this was folly. And our prayer ought to be that people realize that before it's too late. I pray that's what happened with Solomon, that he realized it before it was too late. And so the book of Ecclesiastes then continues with the author describing what has gone on in his own life and what he has learned in the course of that. In chapter 3, we see one of the greatest poems in all of the Bible, a section that has been the source of songs throughout the ages, but uh, particularly in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, For everything, turn, turn, there is a season, turn, turn. Ecclesiastes 3, there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die a time to plant and a time to uproot. And then the author goes on to say the following in verse 11. Speaking of God, he says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. That phrase is so incredibly significant and incredibly powerful. It reminds us that God is the one who has put into our hearts the realization that there is more than just this life. And what is often referred to as the natural knowledge of God is something that God himself has built into us, the realization there is more, and there is a longing in the human heart to know the living God because God designed us that way. And even though we wandered away from him, he has not left us without witness, including the testimony of our own conscience. And that is what Solomon is speaking of here, that God has placed eternity in our hearts and the realization there is is more and we yearn for that it is built in the author goes on then we come to uh, some rather forthright warnings and wisdom sayings that really do speak powerfully Uh, chapter 5 verse 10 it says whoever loves money never has enough how true that is it's the how much is too much or how much do you need one dollar more than what i've got is the human attitude and here solomon is saying if you love money you will never have enough you'll never be satisfied you always want more but he then says however in the end we all end up in the same place not heaven and hell but rather we all die verse 15 says everyone comes naked from their mother's womb and as everyone comes so they depart Uh, we brought nothing into this world it is certain we can take nothing out in the, the words of the book of job that is echoed here in ecclesiastes And then finally, the author begins to tie it all together as he speaks about wisdom. And he says in chapter 7, verse 20, he says, Indeed, there is no one on earth who is righteous, no one who does what is right and never sins. The apostle Paul, uh, a thousand years later, will pick up on those very words. And in Romans chapter 3, he quotes those words first and then a series of words from the Old Testament reminding us how far people have fallen from the living God. But it was Solomon who said it first, on earth there is no one who is righteous, no one who is without sin. He is admitting here his own sin and his own folly. And so He says in expressing what has gone on and what has taken place in his own life, uh, he finally ends this way in chapter 12. He says, verse 1, Remember your Creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come, and the years approach when you say, I find no pleasure in them. Solomon is writing now as one who's experiencing the days of trouble. We don't know how old he was when he died. The Old Testament does not give us a death date of Solomon or how many years he lived. We know that he became a king early. We know that he ruled for 40 years. There is some evidence to suggest that he may have actually taken the the role of king as a teenager at the age of 18. Some have suggested even earlier. 
whatever the case is, he writes now, he's coming to the end of his life, and he reflects back and he says, boy, remember your creator in the days of your youth. In other words, come to the Lord early and don't abandon him. Solomon, if he is indeed the author, is saying, I made that mistake. I knew him when I was young and I wandered away from him. And now I'm at a point where I'm looking back and realizing how foolish I have been and what great folly has attended my so-called great wisdom. And so he says in the end, verse 13, now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commands. For this is the duty of all mankind. Uh, in many ways, you see a reflection of what Jesus would say a thousand years later. He was asked, what is the greatest of the commandments? And Jesus says, the greatest and first commandment is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Solomon ends this book by saying, remember your creator in the days of your youth. Because the end of things is simply... Fear God, in other words, be in awe of God and keep his commandments. Love God, love others. A book that starts out rather pessimistic ends with a very powerful message and a call to come back to the Lord. I pray this is the work of Solomon, and I pray this is what he wrote at the end of his life. Uh, we have no definitive evidence in the rest of Scripture that that's the case, but I pray that that's what we have here. And that in a nutshell, is Ecclesiastes, because folly is living your life without the presence of God. And in the end, it is self-destructive, which brings us now to the fun book. And that's the book of Esther. This is a book that many of the critics of the biblical faith have had a field day with. Uh, you can argue that of all the books in the Old Testament, Daniel and Esther have come under more attack by critics than perhaps any others. Esther has been denounced by many as just pious fiction, uh, as a make-believe story that never really happened. I do not believe that personally at all. And I believe, in fact, there is a great deal of evidence that would indicate this book is firmly anchored in history. In fact, the book of Esther is one of those unique books in the Bible where we can pinpoint what was going on in the rest of the world at the very time this was taking place. And when you realize what was going on in the world at the time of Esther, suddenly the story of Esther comes alive. And so what I'd like to do is look at some of the objections, first of all, and then take a look at who wrote the book. And then we're just going to tell the story in light of what we know of the world scene at the time of Esther. And it is an incredible story. It is an uplifting, powerful story. And it is a reminder of how the enemy has always sought to thwart the salvation plan of God. And God has always stepped into history to defend his name, to defend his people, and prepare for the coming of the Messiah. And boy, it just, it comes out in bold relief here in the book of Esther. So let's begin with some of the objections and some of the answers to those objections. One of the first objections to this book that has been raised by many, including Christian and Jewish uh, scholars, is that the book of Esther never mentions God. And it's true. The name for God does not appear in this book. It is the only book in the Hebrew scriptures where God does not have his name mentioned. I will add, he's all over this book. But his name's not there. Many have called attention to that fact and suggested it, it shouldn't be in the Bible. In fact, some of the movers and the shakers in the Christian world ha have denounced this book, including Martin Luther, who didn't like it at all and wished it wasn't in the Bible. I totally disagree with him, but it, it's a fact. It's fascinating to note, however, we do have a copy of Esther that has God's name over and over and over again. And that is in the Greek translation of Esther, in, in what's called the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament. There are some additional verses. The, the book of Esther is considerably longer in the, uh, the Septuagint. And uh, the name of God is mentioned over 50 times in those editions. And people have debated, well, where did that come from? We will leave that to others. We're going to stick with the Hebrew text tonight. And the fact of the matter is, yeah, God is not mentioned here, but God is 
throughout this book, and it's very evident. In fact, you can argue that the absence of his name makes his presence that much more real. Because you understand, these things could not have happened without God being at work in a powerful way in human history. Now, a second objection that is raised to the book of Esther is that Esther is not mentioned by the great Greek historian Herodotus. And I find it very fascinating that many people who doubt the inerrancy and the inspiration of Scripture will suddenly raise Herodotus, a Greek historian, to the level of, uh, you know, inspired author uh, and say, well, Herodotus, who talks about the events that took place around Esther, never mentions her. Therefore, she couldn't have existed. Quite frankly, Herodotus doesn't mention a lot of important people. And not only that, Herodotus does mention a number of things that never happened. Herodotus is called the father of history. And as I've said before, I believe the real father of history is Moses, who wrote a thousand years before Herodotus. Uh, but Herodotus is a gossip. I, I mean, he's fascinating to read. There's, there's no denying that. And truly influential in Western culture. But uh, very often, Herodotus basically comes down to this. Well, I heard about this story that was passed down, and off he goes. Um, Herodotus does not mention Esther. And by the way, the critics pick up on Herodotus again when it comes to the book of Daniel, because Herodotus describes the fall of Babylon, and he never mentions Belshazzar. Daniel chapter 5 talks about Belshazzar, the king in Babylon, who saw the hand writing on the wall. Critics have said, well, he never mentions Belshazzar, and you know, so Belshazzar must not exist, because the only place we find him is in the Bible. That was true until relatively recently when all of a sudden we found an inscription that has Belshazzar's name and speaks of him the very way that Daniel does. And what has happened is that the scriptures have again been shown to be reliable and trustworthy. A third objection is that Mordecai, one of the main characters in the book of Esther, Esther's old cousin who adopted her after the death of her parents, Mordecai, who is described as, in the end, a major advisor to the king, he's not mentioned in Herodotus either. Up until, again, relatively recent times, many critics said, therefore, this has to be a fictional story until we actually find Mordecai's name in an inscription. And interestingly enough, it's discovered in Susa, the very place where this book takes place, a part of modern-day Iran, one of the great Persian capitals. We read about a fellow by the name of Mardukaya, who was a close advisor to Xerxes. And that is the very king who is described here in the book of Esther. A fourth item that is especially worth noting, the book of Esther describes in considerable detail furnishings in the palace at Susa, the layout of this imperial city and this fortress, uh, where the king's chambers are and so forth. Those things are described in, in considerable detail. What we know historically is that about 30 years after the time of Esther, the city of Susa burned to the ground, and it was covered by the sands of time for centuries about a little over a hundred years ago, it was finally excavated. And what the excavators discovered is that it is laid out the very way that the book of Esther describes it as being laid out. So if the critics are correct, Esther was written long after the fact, and it's entirely fictional. The author of this book got everything right when it comes to the layout of the palace and the fortress at Susa, even though it was destroyed just shortly after the time of Esther. It's obviously written by someone who knew what was going on. I might add, the book of Esther contains numerous Persian words and names. It is very obvious from the internal evidence in this book that it was not written hundreds of years after the fact. If it had been written hundreds of years after the fact, it would have had Greek terms in it. It doesn't have that. There's nothing to indicate that Alexander the Great has moved into this area. As a result, a good deal of internal evidence says this was written close to the actual events. And then finally, uh, worth noting another of the 
key characters. The evil villain of the Esther story is a fellow by the name of Haman the Agagite. What we have learned in relatively recent times, within the last 20 years or so, is that we have found inscriptional evidence that indicates in the Persian Empire at the time of Xerxes, there was a province by the name of Agag. So Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, may well refer to the province from which he comes. What we do know for sure is this man was an anti-Semite. He hated the Jewish people, sought to destroy them, and he came that close. What we have in the book of Esther is a description of a 5th century B.C. attempt at a holocaust. Before Hitler, there was Haman. And Haman almost, almost pulled it off. And that's the story that undergirds the book of Esther. And it's an incredible and amazing story. A couple of other quick notes, and then we'll dive in. Who was the author of this book? There is a Jewish tradition mentioned by the Jewish historian Josephus, who lived at the end of the first century, uh, was a Jewish general and a a Pharisee, an individual who... uh, participated in the revolt against Rome in uh, 66 to 70 AD. Josephus says there was a tradition that Mordecai, the elder cousin of Esther, wrote this book. That is not beyond the realm of the possible. This book has all the markings of an author who was intimately familiar with everything that went on and who knew the story from the inside out. As far as dating the book, we really can't say for sure. If it was written by Mordecai, then it would have been written in all likelihood shortly after the death of Xerxes. And so as a result, uh, the book ends by suggesting that Xerxes' reign is over. Uh, We know that he reigned in until 465 BC. And so we can say the book was written somewhere between 464 BC and maybe 330 BC at the time when Alexander the Great destroyed the Persian Empire, uh, somewhere in that window of time. The setting is especially worth noting. Xerxes was one of the greatest emperors of the Persian Empire and lived at an incredibly important time in human history. And that becomes very evident, a part of the story of Esther, because the book of Esther describes when these events took place. And when you understand those events in light of what was going on in the rest of the world, this book suddenly comes alive in ways that will blow your mind. And so that's how we're going to tell the story tonight. We're going to start with Esther chapter 1, verse 1. This is what we read. This is what happened during the time of Xerxes. The Xerxes who ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. In other words, the modern day Sudan. It says at that time, King Xerxes reigned from his royal throne in the citadel of Susa. And that is exactly true. The Persian rulers up until the time of Xerxes were ruling from Susa. When Susa burns down, they transfer their capital elsewhere. But he reigned from his throne in the royal citadel of Susa, and in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials. Esther mentions the exact timing of several important events. And when we date them in history, it suddenly comes alive. The third year of Xerxes' reign was 483 B.C., What was happening in the world in 483 B.C.? Here's what we know. The Greek historian Herodotus tells us, Xerxes held a big confab at Susa to prepare to invade Greece. And he gathered the movers and shakers, his military commanders, everyone who was anyone in the great Persian empire, which stretched from India all the way through the Middle East into Egypt and down to Sudan. He gathered all of these leaders together and he said, we are now going to conquer the rest of the world. And in 483 BC, the third year of his reign, he holds a massive gathering at Susa, and that is what is described here in the book of Esther. As he holds this huge meeting, he ends it with a gigantic party, and that's what sets into motion the events of this book. The party 
went like this. It went on for seven days. Now, the Persians were famous for the way they imbibed. And as it's described in the book of Esther, uh, the royal wine flowed freely. And after seven days of drinking and celebrating, Xerxes decides it's time to have his, his queen come and appear before all of his drunken buddies. And at that point, he orders the following. We read in Esther chapter 1, verse 10. On the seventh day, when King Xerxes was in high spirits from wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who served him, verse 11, to bring before him Queen Vashti wearing her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and nobles, for she was lovely to look at. Vashti says, I'm not coming. No way. I'm not coming to your drunken party, and I'm not going to parade around in front of your drunken friends. And Xerxes is furious. And at that point, he says, that's it. She's out of here. Calls in his advisors, and they say, we've got to stop this, because if other noble wives start acting like the queen, it's going to be chaos in the empire. And so Xerxes decrees that Vashti's out. And it's on that note that he leaves on campaign. And for the next three years, Xerxes heads from Susa across the Middle East through the Tigris-Euphrates River Valley into what we today call Turkey. And then he leads his army across the Dardanelles into Europe. And his desire is to conquer Europe. And what he has told all of his advisors is, if we destroy the Greeks, the rest of the continent will be ours. He is trying to build the greatest empire ever. And by the way, he led the largest invasion force with the largest fleet the world ever saw until 6 June 1944, the invasion of Normandy. Xerxes' campaign was the largest amphibious operation the world ever saw until the latter days of World War II. By all rights and purposes, Xerxes should have conquered the world. But what we know of history at that time, we know that one of the most remarkable defenses took place and one of the greatest upsets in the history of the world took place in the midst of of Xerxes' reign at the time of Esther. Here's what happened. Xerxes and his troops came down into Greece. Many Greek cities simply gave up and said, we surrender to you. But there were two major Greek cities in particular that said, we will not give in. One of them was Athens. And leading Athens at this time was a brilliant individual by the name of Themistocles, he, Themistocles said it's the wooden walls that will save Athens. And he described the wooden walls as a fleet. The Athenians had suddenly discovered a great deal of silver, and Themistocles was able to persuade them to build a fleet of a couple of hundred triremes, uh, very fast-moving warships. That's the first. The second, Sparta. And one of the Spartan kings, a fellow by the name of Leonidas, resolved that even though it was a major festival when the army couldn't move, he would take his personal bodyguard and try to keep Xerxes from coming any further than possible. Leonidas took 300 troops, his personal bodyguard, to a narrow pass in northern Greece known as Thermopylae. And what followed that are three of the most important battles in the history of of the ancient and, for that matter, modern world. 300 Spartans plus 700 Theban allies held out for a couple of days at Thermopylae. Xerxes had this huge army, but they couldn't get past the Spartans who were in this narrow pass at Thermopylae. It has gone down as one of the, the great defensive operations in the history of warfare. Uh, it is known as the defense of the 300 Spartans. You may well have seen the, the cartoonish movie, uh, The 300, or the, the movie from the 1960s starring Richard Egan, the 
the 300 Spartans. I remember as a kid being fascinated by that battle. I took cardboard and made both a, a breastplate and a shield and then a sword out of cardboard as well because I'm just fascinated by this. And this is what's happening at the time of Esther. The queen has been deposed. Xerxes is in a snit. He desires to trample over the Greeks and conquer the world, and then he'll take care of things back home. And instead, he meets the Spartans who hold him off day after day. And it's only through deceit and trickery where a Greek trader shows him another route to get around the narrow pass. Xerxes is furious. He's held up. His army is kept, you know, waiting. And so they finally get to Athens. They burn the city to the ground, but the Athenians are gone. They took off in their navy, and they went to an island off the coast. And then they hid their ships in a bay known as the Bay of Salamis. And Xerxes is tricked into sending his fleet into the Bay of Salamis, and the Greeks surprise him. In fact, the Greeks would have used a word as they surprised the Persian fleet. Xerxes, by the way, had his throne set up on a hill overlooking the Bay of Salamis so he could watch his navy tear apart the Athenian navy. And instead, he cried out, my men have become like women, because what he watched is his fleet being decimated by the Greeks. As they came into the, the uh, Persian ships, they would ram them. The Greek triremes had large rams on the front of them, and they would ram these things. And then the Greek sailors would say something that we Christians would recognize right away. Uh, they, they'd say, Eureka, we baptize them. Because the Greek word baptize, baptizo, at the time of Esther was a word that was actually a nautical term. It meant to sink a ship. And the Greeks truly did baptize the Persians. By the way, the defeat of the Persian navy at the Battle of Salamis was the greatest loss of life that we have seen in any naval battle with it appears no exceptions. We don't know the exact number who died. In the Battle of Salamis, we believe somewhere in the neighborhood of at least 30,000 Persian sailors lost their lives. It was bloody, it was gory, and it was decisive. And then the next year, 480 B.C., the Persians were finally defeated on land as well at the Battle of Plataea. And at that point, Xerxes goes back home licking his wounds, and he realizes he has not accomplished what he desires. And so he gets back home in the year 479 B.C., which is mentioned in Esther chapter 2, verse 16. Listen to what it says. So Xerxes has come back home. He's depressed and discouraged. He's lost his fleet. His army has been decisively defeated. These Greeks have just made a mockery of him. And so we read the following. Chapter 2, verse 16. She was taken to King Xerxes in the royal residence in the tenth month, the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. So 479 B.C., the seventh year of Xerxes' reign, when he's come back from def being defeated by the Greeks, he gets back home and he says, you know what, I need a diversion. Now, interestingly enough, the Greek historian Herodotus says that Xerxes, upon being defeated by the Greeks, came back and immersed himself in his harem. And what we read here in Esther fits it exactly. He comes back home and his closest advisors are trying to cheer up their depressed king before he orders them killed. And they say, you know, we ought to have a beauty contest. And whoever is the most beautiful woman in the empire, she'll become your new queen. And Xerxes says, that sounds like a good idea to me. And so what happens, as it's described here in Esther, they have this huge contest. They find beautiful young virgins from all over the empire. And among them is a young Jewish girl by the name of Hadassah. Her cousin, older cousin, is Mordecai. He is somehow connected to King Xerxes and the royal residence. Esther 
or Hadassah as her Hebrew name is. She was given this Persian name, Esther, which we believe comes from the name of the Persian deity, Ishtar. Esther is taken out of her home and told, you are going to become one of the ladies in waiting for King Xerxes in his harem. Now, she has no choice in this matter. It, it is a, you know, a perverted story. There's no getting away from that. But for a year, Esther and all of these other young women are given beauty treatments. And then when they're at their prime, they are brought one after one to King Xerxes to sleep with him. And the contest goes like this, according to the book of Esther. The one that he likes the most will become his new queen. I I mean, it is despicable, but it is real. And it fits with what we know about King Xerxes, what we know about the Persian Empire. And in many ways, it doesn't sound a whole lot different from 21st century America. This would be a reality show today. This would be The Bachelor. Xerxes is the bachelor, and here come all the young ladies who, you know, who are seeking to woo and win him. What we are told is that when Hadassah came in, not only was she beautiful, but her attitude was rather unique. And the chief eunuch, a fellow by the name of Haggai, took her under his wings and realized this is one very classy lady. And so he gave her special privileges. It's described in the book of Esther. And when she is finally brought to to King Xerxes, he says, this is the one I want. And so 479 B.C., he uh, chooses the winner of the beauty contest. And that's what goes on. And now the story really gets exciting. Because what we learn is, Esther is now taken into the palace, becomes Xerxes' queen, but her cousin Mordecai keeps checking up on her. And one day, Mordecai learns that two of Xerxes' servants are actually plotting to kill the king. And so he passes the word on to Esther, who gives the word to the king and says, this comes from my cousin Mordecai. The plot is revealed The two men are killed, executed. Xerxes is thankful, and the story goes on. And what we read is, in the 12th year of Xerxes' reign, when Esther has been queen for five years, now a new character shows up, and it's Haman the Agagite. Haman is a wealthy, influential leader in the Persian government. He despises Mordecai. Mordecai refuses to kowtow to Haman, and Haman decides he's not only going to destroy Mordecai, he is going to kill all the Jews. What we know is we're reading the story, but what Haman did not know is the queen is related to Mordecai. And now things really get fascinating. And this is where you look and you say, God's name may not appear in this book, but God is all over this book. Because Haman plots and he finally comes to the king and he says, Oh, King Xerxes, there is a group of people here in your empire and they are different from all of the rest of us. They don't do the things that we do. They're they're not like us at all. And we just need to wipe them out. And you could see how Xerxes would be very open to that because he's just gotten his clock cleaned by the Greeks. And now he's got, you know, his chief advisor coming to him saying, There are some people here and they're going to undermine mind your government. We just need to get rid of them. And Haman goes on. He says, I'll tell you what, I'll give you 375 tons of silver if you give me the orders to kill these folks. And Xerxes says, go for it. I won't even charge you. And so the order is given, the order of the kings of the Medes and Persians, an order which cannot be revoked, that the Jewish people are to be destroyed. It is to be a holocaust. The way they determine the date is they cast a lot. It's called a poor. And they cast a couple of those lots from which we get the term poor reem, which is plural for poor. It is determined that the date that the Jewish people will be destroyed is the 13th day of Adar. And so it's almost a year before the attack on the Jewish people will come. 
But Haman is masterminding this. He determines this is going to be the perfect day. And so about 11 months into the future, Jews throughout the empire are going to be killed. And that's when the word comes to Mordecai. And Mordecai learns what's happening, puts on sackcloth, begins praying, is, you know, disturbed no end. And the word gets to Esther. Mordecai is just, he is distraught. Esther sends one of the eunuchs to Mordecai and says, what's going on? And Mordecai says, listen, they're going to destroy our people. And he gives this reply to Queen Esther. Esther chapter 4. One of the greatest sections in this entire book and one of the most amazing portions in all of the Old Testament scriptures. Esther has sent word to Mordecai, you know, what's going on here? And Mordecai lets it be known that there's going to be destruction coming against our people. And Esther replies, hey, I haven't even been able to see the king for the last 30 days. And you know what the law is. If someone goes to the king and he doesn't want to see him, they'll get killed. And so this is what happens. Verse 12, when Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this, for such a time as this. And what is Esther's response? Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Esther, just an incredibly bold and courageous woman. But she does it with fasting. And while God is not mentioned and prayer is not mentioned, the fact of the matter is this is a lady who realizes our deliverance is from above and he is our only hope. And because I trust in the living God, I'm willing to put my life on the line and if need be, lay down my life for my people. Esther is one of the great heroes of the Bible. And so after three days of fasting, she goes into the king's chamber And she comes before him, and he holds out the golden staff to her. And she says, Your Majesty, I've got something that I'd like to invite you to dinner. And there's a request that I have. And the king says, Well, what's the request? She says, Just come to dinner and bring your chief advisor, Haman, with you. And so the word gets to Haman now, and he's thinking, I have, my life is just going so well. I'm going to destroy Mordecai. I'm going to destroy the Jewish people. And now the queen has invited me to a private dinner with just her and King Xerxes. I am living large. And he goes home and he tells his wife and his family of how much he has accomplished and what a mover and a shaker he is and how he hates Mordecai, but he's going to the queen's dinner. And his wife says, wow, you are on a roll. And she says, what you ought to do is you ought to put in the backyard, we ought to put a 75 foot high stake. And after you've had dinner with the queen and the king, you ask the king to put Mordecai, impale him on that. And that'll show who's running the place. And Haman says, what a great idea. And so in the backyard, they put up this 75 foot high stake. And at that point, Haman heads off to have dinner with the queen and the king. And he thinks, this is so good. And they have dinner together. And the king says to Esther, well, what can I do for you? And Esther says, well, your majesty, could I invite you to dinner again tomorrow? You and Haman. And then I'll tell you what I want. And the king says, fine. This has been a wonderful meal. I'll do it. And Haman's thinking, oh, this is so good. I get to go back again. You know, what Haman doesn't know is that night Xerxes didn't sleep well. And so to entertain him, 
what he does is he calls in one of his aides and said, would you read to me some of the stories of things that have been going on in my empire lately? The servant opens up the royal records and by golly, he just happens to turn to the spot where it says a fellow named Mordecai saved the king's life by exposing an assassination plot and passing it on to Queen Esther. And Xerxes says, did we ever reward him for that? And the aide says, no, your majesty, never have. We need to do that. The next morning has dawned, and who shows up in the palace but Haman? And uh, Xerxes says, send him in. I, I, I need to talk to him. And Haman comes into the king's presence, and Xerxes says to Haman, you know, if I wanted to reward one of my main guys... What would you say should be the perfect reward for him? And Haman's thinking, it's got to be me. And Haman says, well, you know, your majesty, if I were you and I wanted to reward one of my top guys, here's what I'd do. I'd get one of the, the king's robes, a robe that he's worn, and I'd bring out his royal stallion, and I'd put this person you want to honor on that horse wearing the king's robe, and then I'd have one of your other, you know, important officials walk in front of him and lead the horse through the city of Susa and shout out in front of everyone else, this is the way the king honors a man of integrity that he wants to honor. And Xerxes says, what a great idea. And Haman is thinking, all right. And Xerxes says, would you go get my horse and, and my robe and put Mordecai on the horse? And would you lead him through the city and announce that, please? And Haman thinks, oh, no. Yeah, I mean, this, this is disaster. And that's what happens. And when it's all over, Mordecai is wearing the robe and Haman goes home with his head hanging down. And all of a sudden it's time to go to the queen's banquet. And Mordecai is still alive and honored. And Haman is told by his wife, you are not going to succeed. Haman is escorted to the palace. He sits down to dinner. He's reflecting on how badly this is all gone, and it suddenly goes from bad to absolute worse. Because in the midst of the dinner, the king says, Now, Queen Esther, what is it that you want? And Esther says the following, Your Majesty, if this were simply about me and my people becoming slaves, I wouldn't bother you with this. But there is a person in your empire who wants to kill me and all of my relatives and all of my people. And Xerxes says, who in the world is it? And Esther says, it's him, Haman. Xerxes is furious. He gets up. He walks out of the dining room. He goes out into the garden. He is burning with anger. Haman knows this is really going downhill in a hurry. And so in a last desperate plea, Haman throws himself on the queen's dining couch as the queen is lying there. And Xerxes walks back into the room. And he says, it's not enough that you wanted to kill her. You want to rape her too, huh? You're a dead man. In come the king's aides. They put a mask over Haman's face. He's taken to his own backyard, and he's impaled on the 75-foot-high pole that he had erected for Mordecai. Then the tables are really turned. The king speaks to Esther, and Esther says, Your majesty, can you issue an order so that my people can defend themselves? And the king says, absolutely. Not only that, but he takes the ring from Haman's finger, the signet ring, and he gives it to Mordecai. And Mordecai now becomes one of the chief advisors of the king. And what happens is an order is sent throughout the empire saying that on the 13th day of Adar, the day when the Jewish people are to be slaughtered, they are to defend themselves and defeat their enemies. What happens is what was intended for destruction becomes a means by which God saves his people and destroys their enemies. We read in the book of Esther that throughout the empire, 75,000 anti-Jewish rioters were killed. Deliverance comes, and it comes, and it becomes a festival that will be celebrated from that time on. To this day, the Jewish people celebrate the festival of Purim, 
which is described in the final chapters of the book of Esther. Purim is a time when they party. And in fact, to this day, when devout Jewish people go to the synagogue for Purim, they read the story of Esther. And every time Haman's name is mentioned, the kids have noisemakers and people boo because they are celebrating and thanking God for the mighty deliverance that he has wrought. And if you think about it, Esther, a little Jewish girl who at the time of deliverance may have only been in her early 20s. She is used by God to save the Jewish people, to save Messiah's line. She's truly one of the great heroes of Scripture. And her story, her story is incredible. Thanks so much for listening to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge. Today's program was sponsored by Awake Us Now. We hope today's message was a blessing. If you are asking yourself, now what? We encourage you to learn more about God at our website, awakeusnow.com. And please come back and join us again next time.